Hello, and welcome to Curators in Conversation, brought to you by the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. For those of you who are not familiar with Brandywine, here's a little background. BWA has been a vital diversity-driven nonprofit cultural institution for 50 years. It's located in Philadelphia. Its mission is to provide and share art and produce art in order to inspire and build bridges among global communities. BWA has several ongoing pro programs. It funds short-term residencies for artists to produce limited edition prints. It works to bring the art of diverse cultures to institutions and communities throughout the through, throughout the country um, by having exhibitions and by creating satellite collections across the whole United States. BWA offers in, in, <laughs> internships to Philadelphia high school and college students and who are majoring in art or in a related field. And the latest project called Artura is a free interactive digital archive of culturally diverse art that gives educators and students access to information and images representing cult contemporary culture and traditions from around the globe. You can access this very unique website by registering at artura.org. And you can find out more about Brandywine Workshop at its website, Brandywine Workshop and archives.org. As part of the residencies and the exhibitions at Brandywine, we have invited artists and curators to participate in Artists and Curators Conversation. Today's guest is Jessica Womack, a PhD candidate in the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University. She has been, <clears throat> she has been invited to curate the current exhibition, Comings and Goings, Mobility, Experimentation, and Exploration in the Art of African Diaspora. The show will continue through February 24th, 2023 in the printed image gallery at the Brandywine Workshop at 730 South Broad Street in Philadelphia. Jessica Womack researches modern and contemporary art of the Caribbean Black diaspora and focuses on, on native, on nation building, identity, reformation, and space spatialization. She is especially interested in African diasporic religions and their iconic, iconographs and visual cultures. Originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, Jessica received her AB in art history from Dartmouth College and in, 20, in 2014 and her MA from Princeton in 2019. Before starting her graduate work, she held cultural excuse me, curatorial and programming positions at the Hood Museum of Art in Dartmouth and the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Jessica has participated in the Studio Museum in Harlem's education practicum and was selected as the curatorial fellow for the African Diaspora Institute. Her writing has been included in several prestigious publications. And she has written a wonderful catalog for this exhibition, which is on sale at the Brandywine Workshop and also available to you online. Here it is. Um, and so I'd like to welcome you, Jessica, to the Artists in Conversation, and I'll leave it to you. Hi, Patty. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I am very excited to be sharing a little bit about this exhibition and I'm very grateful to BWA for the opportunity to curate it and also to be talking to you all today. So as Patty mentioned, this exhibition is called Comings and Goings, Mobility, Experimentation and Exploration in the Art of the African Diaspora. So just to get us started for today, a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about. So first I'll give a bit of background about the exhibition, then I'll discuss my research process, how I got to thinking about the title, the argument. I will then discuss the argument that I, I am making and then go into some of the themes that structure the exhibition. 
And then I'll show some images of the final form just for those who haven't yet seen it or, or won't be able to. And then we'll transition into a Q&A portion. So if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will talk about them at the end of, of this sort of presentation moment. So in terms of the organizing or the organizational process for the exhibition, essentially I was invited to do this exhibition, to curate this exhibition as a part of BWA's 50th anniversary celebration. So it was founded in 1972 by Alan Edmonds, who was the founder and also the former director. So he invited me essentially to come in and curate an exhibition, loosely thinking about um, art from the African diaspora. So it was very much given um, wiggle room and you know, I should say free, free reign to think about the collection, put together an exhibition that was really drawn from the permanent collection to celebrate the founding of the institution. And it's also incredible and long tenure. So in terms of my motivation, I really wanted to make sure that I was thinking about the history of, of the BWA um, in particular, the history of the artists in residence program, how artists have been coming to BWA to produce works in the print workshop over the past 50 years. I also was really excited about the idea of working with an institution that has had so many different prints that have been created at the institution and really wanted to highlight the diversity of styles and the different approaches that were used by artists who were, you know, at the South Broad Street location and, and other locations before that um, for, for making their own prints. So in terms of, like I mentioned, um, this exhibition was curated uh, to coincide with the 50th anniversary celebration. This happened, there was a celebration weekend that coincided with the opening of the exhibition. And a few people were, were celebrated at that. Art historian, Valerie um, Castle, Valerie Castle Oliver, artist, Julie Moretu, and then uh, art educator, Bernard Thompson, Bernard Young. So it's been, it was a really great experience to be able to have this exhibition coincide with just such a celebratory weekend. And I just wanted to show some, some photographs from that. So in terms of Artura, as I mentioned earlier, this was a really huge resource. So I live in North Carolina. I'm not local to Philadelphia. So for me, it was really an opportunity to get acquainted with the collection. So a lot of different arts institutions, of course, have various different cataloging procedures. What's great about Artura is it's really public facing and the search feature is quite simple. So what I was able to do was essentially go to the object page and it pulls up, as you can see here, I took this screenshot a few days ago, pulls up over a thousand objects. And so essentially what I did was comb through every single one of these objects. As someone who was external to BWA, I wasn't super familiar with the works that were in the collection that had been produced there. So for me, there was very much a learning process that was pretty crucial to understanding the history of the institution, the works that were produced there, and the artists who were in residence there who had, who had been in relationship with, with the institution. So as I mentioned, I went through all of this. Of course, you have, um, I had some initial ideas. For example, I wanted to think about religion in the African diaspora. However, in conversations with Alan, I actually learned that an exhibition was already being curated that was thinking about that. And so that actually was open in the months before comings and goings. And it was called uh, All My Ancestors. So, you know, I had my idea. It wasn't going to work because, of course, you don't want two exhibitions back to back that are looking at pretty much the same thing. So it was really back to the drawing board. And after, you know, going through all of the different objects I was seeing in the prints, I was really inspired by a number of different artworks, but then also the quotes that were provided um, in the database from the artists who were making these works. So for example, on the left here, you see a work by Michael Harris called Mother in the Presence of Myth that was made in uh, 1994. So on the page on Artura for this object, we also get a quote from the artist, which again, as someone who was researching abroad was very helpful to me. So you'll see that uh, Michael Harris says, you know, this work is based on Yoruba culture from Nigeria. The form of, this, of these images is derived from the shrine wall paintings uh, done by women. They use a color scheme dominated by darks. 
doo-doo, oranges and reds, it's pupa, and the universe. So those are, are uh, and, and lights, sorry, fun fun. And so these are all Yoruba words that the artist is including in, in his description. And so in terms of this, this was really inspiring to me to see this is an artist who's based in the United States, who goes to Nigeria and is thinking about Yoruba culture um, and how that's really creating a connection across space and time and how that's inspiring his homage to to women and, and mothers. Um, so you can see this on our tour. If you look up this work, that full quote is there for you. Another example is a work by Curly Raven Holton, who was talking about his trip to Japan. So he's talking about here, Blind Spots was inspired by a trip to Japan to study Japanese traditional printmaking techniques. My desire was to create densely composed images representing the confluence of people and cultures. So for me, this was really when I started thinking about, okay, how do I make sense of, of these different objects? What are some of the themes that I'm seeing coming through? So I'll get to this a little bit more, but this is really when I'm starting to think, okay, we're talking about movement, connection across space and time, um, but then also an artist like Michael Harris, who is thinking about a culture and a people in, in Africa, the Oracle pe people, um, and then Curly Holton, who's thinking, or who traveled to Japan and who's starting to experiment with his work. And he's learned, he went to learn. Um, so these are really, that was sort of when the idea starts, started to cohere um, for me. So you'll see here that work by Holton again. I went to uh, the BWA in December of 2021 with Anna Irvin McKesson, who is one of my professors at Princeton, a great mentor. And she also served as a curatorial advisor for this exhibition. exhibition. So she and I were at BWA together with, um, with Alan and some other folks on the team who essentially pulled different works from the archive and from the collection for us to be able to see. So I had my checklist that, of works that I had prepared from looking at Artura, but then also um, because they were familiar, staff at, at BWA were familiar with, with how, what I was thinking about and, and the argument that I was hoping to make, uh, they also pulled other objects for me. So a work that wasn't then on Artura uh, that I saw in person in Philadelphia in 2021 was uh, this work by Ed Clark. And Ed Clark is someone who was born in New Orleans, uh, lived at, in Chicago, grew up in Chicago. And in the 50s, he goes to Paris and he's in a, in a studio and he picks up a broom. And it's at that moment, he begins incorporating the broom and movement into actually painting. So he would have a canvas on the floor and put put out uh, paint on, the, on top of that canvas and then actually use the broom to sweep that paint across. Uh, the canvas. And so you see here, this is a silk screen, a silk screen print, so it's not a canvas, but the translation of that sort of technique and the visual, the form that it's actually, that it's, that it gives um, and, and translating that into a silk screen print. So that's a work that I saw for the first time at BWA. There were also two works that I was considering by Vincent Smith, the one on the top called Below the Sahara and then the one on the bottom called Jankadu Festival. And both of these works I was very interested in from researching them on Artura, but then in the actual space of BWA, I did make the decision um, to incorporate the Jankadu Festival um, print because I thought it was very dynamic. It's also, I, I think a lot about Jankadu and my, my own work for my dissertation on Jamaican art and culture. Um, so this is a work I was really excited to include in the exhibition. And then uh, this is a photograph that was taken more recently at the opening weekend in October of 2022 of uh, Jessica Hammond, who is the collections manager. And uh, she graciously let me include this in the presentation just because I wanted to show those who are not maybe familiar with how archives or works of art kind of are, how archives are stored or works of art are stored that you can see, you know, at BWA, there are these drawers and all of the prints lie flat. And so when they get pulled, they of course have to be pulled out very carefully um, and then placed flat on, on a surface. And then you can examine them that way. So it's a very exciting place to be. I love being in the archives. I love being sort of behind the scenes in art museums. So it was a very um, amazing experience to, to do that at BWA. So in terms of the argument that I in, ended up finalizing for the exhibition, 
a motivator for me was the work of Black feminist geographers. These are uh, scholars who I have been thinking about and, and reading for a while, and I'm always really excited to think across disciplines and sort of ex explode the disciplinary kind of conventions to consider how thinking about space and movement can be productively put in conversation with artists and art making. So this was a great exhibition to do that. And, and the works, you know, led me, led me to that. So in terms of uh, a motivator, um, there was a work by a text by Catherine McKittrick, who is a geographer um, called Demonic Grounds, and it focuses on Black women, but she does talk a lot about space, place, and Black life. So I'll read this. This is a long quote, but it's a great quote. Um, and I would hope that, you know, if, if anyone is interested in learning more, this is a really incredible book, so I do highly recommend it. Um, so it was, uh, she says, space and place give Black lives meaning in a world that has, for the most part, incorrectly deemed Black populations and their attendant geographies as ungeographic and or philosophic, philosophically, sorry, sorry, that's a typo, under, undeveloped. We can expose domination as a visible spatial project that organizes names and sees social differences and determines where social order happens. Indeed, Black matters are spatial matters. So this uh, was really inspiring to me and, and has driven a lot of my work, just thinking about the ways that space organizes our, our lives just as humans, but then also how space is used as a tool of control for Black people, control of Black people, but then also, as I discussed in the catalog, how it's an important site of resistance. And this is something that Catherine McKittrick talks about at length in, in this text and her other work as well. Um, so in terms of how I, I was thinking with this. It was an opportunity to consider how space does shape Black life and Black livingness through the work of several different artists that were included in the BWA collection. Um, so in terms of some of the other you know, questions, of course, this is coming from the work, I'm thinking about how space and spatialization are shaping the lives of, of not only, of course, Black artists, but then also Black people. Um, and then also my own experiences of, of movement and, and mobility and how I literally feel when I go other places or when I walk out of my house or when I go to a different continent. Um, all of those are, are really important things to consider. And, and that's how racialization happens. So that's also a key driver of the exhibition as well. Um, as I did mention, you know, we're thinking about space as a, as a technique or a tool of control, but then also resistance. So a lot of the artists who are included in the exhibition are also thinking about contesting those limitations and, and creating space for themselves or space for their communities. Um, and I, I really did want to emphasize the way that space um, can also allow for the shaping of various solidarities in different ways of, as a, another scholar, Sylvia Winter, um, who inspires Catherine McKittrick quite a bit, uh, she says it can inspire different ways of seeing and being, seeing and feeling and, or being and knowing is, is how she actually frames it. So I've included this work by Keith Morrison here, who is an artist, um, is an artist born in Jamaica and uh, Wild Kingdom. And I was thinking about this and, and I wrote about it in the catalog in terms of a work um, Eye for the Tropics by art historian Krista Tom Thompson, who basically discusses the ways that the Caribbean or the tropics are framed as or are controlled through different sorts of representational programs like photographs or postcards um, and how that actually creates an idea and an expectation of what that region is, that it's a space that has been heavily controlled. By, by British influence or other colonial influences. So I thought that this was just a really interesting work to include in this, in this exhibition, the actual process of not someone who is other to the Caribbean representing that space, but someone who actually is there representing it for, for themselves. So that's just something I was thinking about in terms of this work. As I mentioned, there are four themes to the exhibition that give it some internal structure. One is culture and history around Africa and the African diaspora. The second is technical and conceptual experimentation. 
The third is M mobility, so M mobility, but then also mobility. And then the fourth is the local. And then these are just some works that are inspiring um, that helped me really come to formulate these these themes. So work like by John McDowell or John Dowell, excuse me, uh, where he was thinking about voodoo from Haiti. Uh, work like this one, um, Afro Blue Matter by Sonia Clark, who is really experimenting with, with printmaking, uh, but is also thinking about space quite conceptually. She says she's considering the space between the teeth of the comb, excuse me, as the place where culture is. Um, I thought that was just really interesting and very poetic. And then this work by Janet Taylor Pickett, where she uses a um, a print of a slave ship and then incorporates it into this work that is looking at memory and, and actually has created a, a representation of a jacket. And then the, finally a work by Larry Walker who's really thinking very specifically about um, these plants that grow out in the US West. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about these different themes. So in terms of the first uh, the first theme, the culture and the history around Africa and the African diaspora, again, everything is grounded in the work. So for me, um, I'm looking at, or I looked at this, this print by Eugene Grigsby called Yemaya, and Yemaya is a deity orisha um, at Condomble in, in Brazil. She, her, she's, um, she has a number of different names in various different places around the world that also are thinking about um, this Yoruba tradition, like in Cuba, it's Yemaya, um, for example. And so having this artist who has gone to Brazil, he has thought about Candomblé and is really interested about the power of this figure, uh, Yemaya. So um, a lot of the different artists in the exhibition, like Keith Morrison, who I've included another work by here, have either traveled to various places around Africa and the African diaspora, or they're also they're imagining it. And so there's this act of actually creating a work that is in connection or in the spirit of creating connection with different Black people and Black populations around the globe. Um, the idea of, of creating those relationships, or they are imagining what that experience would be like to create those relationships. So I was really motivated. There were a lot of different works. Um, this is probably the largest section because I think a lot of the artists, um, Black artists who are, at least that I came across in doing the research, were really thinking about being a part of a diasporic community. Um, so that's also just really interesting that that's a, a through line, it, it seemed to me, in, in the BWA collection. Um, I mentioned this briefly with Sonia Clark's work on an earlier slide, but um, I was also thinking about the ways that travel and mobility are also exploding the ways that people are producing various different art forms or, or their artwork. So uh, for example, um, Pamela Sundstrom, she talks about, she's someone who was born in Botswana. She traveled and, and was raised and grew up in a lot of different places. So she has this alter ego called As Me uh, that she created. And this is a work called Me As Me, where she's thinking about the connections between herself, but then also this alter ego that can sort of withstand all the turmoil of the travel and the different ways that one is seen in different locations, locales. Um, and then I, I did mention this work by Holton earlier. Um, he's someone who I said, you know, traveled to Japan, was interested in printmaking, took classes and learned how to do it. And so he's incorporating different references that are very prominent in the Japanese printmaking tradition, like this geisha figure here, um, and also layering different figures on top of each other um, in, in this. So really thinking about the sort of technical experimentation here, this isn't um, a, 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 a woodblock print, which would have been the traditional printmaking technique in Japan that he would have went to learn. It's an offset lithograph. Uh, but that said, he is really inspired by that type of technical uh, approach for this, for this print. And then of course, like I mentioned, this idea of experimenting more conceptually to play with idea of oneself. The third theme is immobility. So I, as I mentioned, I'm thinking about movement, mobility, and then also the, the immobility, the act or, or the condition of not being able to move. 
Um, as someone who is you know, from New Orleans, I saw this work by Howard Dina Pindell, and I was really thinking of um, my experience as a 14 year old, um, you know, evacuating from, from Hurricane Katrina and then hearing stories and knowing family friends and, and, you know, people who couldn't move. And so, and who couldn't leave, who couldn't leave that storm and the devastation, of course, that was experienced. And, and so this is a work that really got me thinking of the fact that some people can move and can't, who can do it, why, what, what sort of access or resources are required um, and, and how there are conditions of inequity, of course. Um, and then this also extends to this work by Juan Sanchez, who is uh, from Puerto Rico and thinking about the condition and differentiated treatment that Puerto Ricans experience because of their um, sort of between condition of of the United States, but not really because of the way that the United States government has um, occupied Puerto Rico and, and colonized Puerto Rico for the past over a hundred years. Um, so really thinking about anti-Blackness as being uh, crucial here of, of something that drives um, immobility and also the fact that uh, one of the key components of the Afri African diaspora, of course, is uh, the Atlantic slave trade. So that is about movement, but that movement that is not, that was not chosen, that was forced. And the last theme is the local. So there are a few works in the Brandywine collection that were specifically or very evidently looking at a particular locale. So there's this work by Sam Gilliam here, um, and then who titles it Untitled, but also in parentheses calls it Philadelphia. So he was producing this in Philly um, and gives this, this title. But then also this work by um, Michael Platt, who was in Australia for quite a bit of time and made this print. And I believe his wife wrote this poem and it really is thinking about um, Aboriginal Australians and nature and indigeneity in that sort of way. So there's, you know, the play there. So I will conclude here. Um, I, I appreciate you all's attention, but I will conclude here with just some installation shots. As I mentioned, I was living in, I live in North Carolina, so I wasn't able to be there for the install, uh, but I worked with the BWA staff who did a great job installing the exhibition. Um, and we worked you know, together to kind of figure out placement for certain things. Um, in particular, I really wanted this uh, work by Pamela Sundstrom on a wall that's near an elevator because it's a much larger work. So the scale kind of plays there. Um, but then you'll see, you know, works are juxtaposed next to each other. And that allows you, I didn't want the themes to be so overbearing. I wanted people to be able to come in with their own context, but then they also have the catalog should they like any additional um, input from me, shall we say. But this is the final form of the exhibition, and here's one last exhibition shot. So just to kind of recap here, the comings and goings was a great opportunity to be able to curate this exhibition that was really in tandem with the 50th anniversary. The exhibition was very much driven by the artists, their statements and their artworks. And I wanted to make sure that people could find their own point of entry to the works that were on display. And I very much wanted to emphasize the transformative nature of space and how experiences of space can lead to solidarities. Also the ability to experiment and play and to change and grow one's artistic practice. Um, and also the themes are, you know, my, my sort of overlay to help give cohesion or coherence to the works, but I very much understand that someone else could come in and, and have the same exact works of art and have different themes or different ideas about how they connect to each other. Um, but that's the amazing opportunity to be able to add my voice to, to this. So this these are my thoughts about it. I would love to hear any of you all's thoughts. And then the final note is that the exhibition, as Patty mentioned, is still on view and it closes on February 24th. So if you're in Philly or able to get there before, before then, um, please do check it out. And I would love to hear your thoughts. So thank you so much for that. I'll stop sharing. Jessica, thank you so much for that. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions? And I, again, reiterate what Jessica has said. Anyone in the audience can put a question in the chat. 
uh, and we'll get to it. So Jessica, can you tell me, is there anything in particular that you learned from your experience of curating this exhibition? Thank you, Patty, for the question. From curating this exhibition, I definitely had the opportunity to think really critically. There, and there's always so many, like I mentioned, points of entry to works of art. And I think as someone who I'm very energized by making sure that anyone can come in and, and find something that resonates with them. So I think um, something that really guided me was making sure that everything I was writing was accessible. I really tried to use accessible language. I really tried to, you know, pick works that I thought would be engaging in, in different ways and, and for different audiences. So I think this was a, a great learning experience for me in terms of really attending to an audience and obviously paying deep respect to the works and to the artists um, and just seeing myself as a facilitator. You know, I think um, I, I, I think sometimes there can be the idea that like, this is, this is it, this is the way you see the work, but I never want that to be the way that my writing or my work comes off. So I think this was a good experience to learn how to do that, especially in a, a public facing institution, because a lot of my previous curatorial experiences have, have just been a little smaller. So this was a great, you know, first opportunity to to really hone my skills at being very audience focused. Thank you. Um, so Jessica also, can I ask you about the themes? How did you come to the themes that you chose? Yes, so I um, you know, basically just wanted something that could help put different objects in the exhibition in conversation with with each other. Um, as you know, I mentioned, obviously, there were over a 1000 works of art in the in the, in the Brandywine's collection that I could have chosen. And so it was really trying to find works that complemented each other. Um, and then that also made it in accessible for for audiences. So I, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but when I think about someone coming to an art museum or a gallery, I think of my mom. And I want, you know, my mom, who she's, you know, she might not love that I say this, but she isn't, she likes, she likes art now, I think, but she hasn't been a big art lover, shall we say. Um, but I think about her, you know, she saw one work of art, and it really spoke to her at one point. And I remember seeing her and it hurt, like her eyes opened and her face lit up. And it was just so amazing to see that. And so I think about her, I want someone like my mom to be able to come off, come in and be like, oh, okay, I understand like culture and history around the African diaspora. I think, you know, people understand, um, the importance of, of culture and history, obviously. And so really focusing on something that is pretty legible and say like, this is what these artists are doing because that's what they are doing. And like having a space for the presentation of that, that was really the motivation. So I just wanted to make sure in coming up with the themes that they were very legible and that they were, yeah, legible and accessible, I would say. So that's how I, I came up with the themes. It was really from um, the motivation of, of wanting to be legible, but then also wanting to um, put the objects in conversation with each other in a way that the artists are, are saying, you know, I'm interested in this place. I'm interested in this history. I'm interested in this figure from history, or I'm doing this for the first time. So listening to the artists um, was, was really another important factor for coming up with the themes. And were there any particular challenges um, that you met while you were curating the exhibition besides having to do it virtually? Yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was a joy to do it for sure. Um, I think a, a challenge I would say is you know I think this is when you're coming in as an external curator and you're not bringing in maybe a commission works or, or the own the show that you you know you're working with a collection so I'm working I was working with BWA collection obviously so as someone who's coming in from the outside I'm not 
you know, in the, in the uh, drawers, the archive drawers every day or every week. So I don't, I didn't know I had to learn about what was in the collection. Um, at what moments were things created? I also had to, you know, learn about the history of, of the institution more than I knew to be able to, in, in my opinion, you know, speak, um, confidently about the importance of different figures at different moments. Um, so I would say that that was definitely, I won't say maybe a challenge, but there was a, a learning curve to be able to get to the place where I felt, okay, I feel pretty confident that I've seen a lot of the work in the BWA collection. Now I'm gonna start trying to figure out how I can put pieces together um, in a way that I think people might like and, and hopefully learn from. And was there any particular artist that has impacted your research, either in the exhibition or not in the exhibition? Um, so I, any artist that's impacted, well, well this very much gets off um, the, the, the exhibition because they're, they're not in the exhibition, but um, I came to study the Caribbean by learning actually through religion. I was just sort of trying to find my place in art history as an early art history student. Um, and I wasn't so enthusiastic by some, about some of the classes I was I was taking, but I have been taking a, a Cuban art or a Cuban religion class, or it was actually called Afro diasporic religions. And I love this class and I was talking to the professor and she was like, oh, have you heard of Rufaio Lam? Have you heard of Manuel Mendive? And that was the moment I was like, I would love to learn more. I saw, I went and looked up their work. I um, was so drawn to it. And I think, you know, I should really emphasize you get drawn into work. You, you find it, you know, I have visceral reactions when I see things and they speak to me, right? And, and that's such an important part of this process too. Um, so, you know, I had, I had visceral reactions to some of, some of you know, these, these artists' work and that just prompted me to go out and learn more. And, and so it was by the time I was maybe a junior, senior in, in college, I was focusing specifically um, on, on, the Caribbean and, and the Black diaspora, um, and then wanted to go to graduate school. So that's what really drove me. So I actually started out in art history, but then I came to my topic, not through art history, just sort of around it, um, because of, you know, this great class and this great professor who, who directed me to these artists who I still think a lot about, um, and still really enjoy their work and would, you know, I think a lot about it. So. Um, well, I'm so happy to see that you were able to use Artura, um, Brandywine's newest and very unique project, because it is very difficult to find um, artists of, of the diaspora anywhere. Um, and that's a nice, very compact, and even though there's a thousand <laughs> images, it's such a great resource for people like yourself. And I'm so glad to see that you put it to good use. So on behalf of Brandywine, um, I'd really like to thank you for putting together a wonderful show that I know everyone enjoys. And uh, I invite the audience to please come and see the exhibition. It's great on screen, but even better in person. Uh, and uh, I hope that we can work with you again sometime, Je uh, Jessica. Yeah, I, don't you think, I don't think if there are any and actually, I see one question from, from Mary, Mary Lee. Okay, why don't we answer Mary Lee's question? Before we, we head off for the evening, but yes, thank you very much for the question. So Mary asks, uh, did you incorporate the artist quotes that spoke to you in your research in your research into wall text? So I didn't into wall text. There is an intro in the exhibition. There's an intro panel right when you walk in that gives the overview of the exhibition, uh, but there aren't individual um, text for each work, individual sort of, you know, panels for each work. But what I did was there are a lot of these quotes in the catalog and I contextualized them much more than I did, you know, just in this overview, but weave them into, you know, the argument. I mean, they are making my, they are 
they are how I got to my argument. So they're pretty crucial in that catalog. And the catalog, um, I think, as Patty mentioned, is available online. Just if you go to the, the Brandywine's website and you go to the exhibition page, uh, you'll see a link at the bottom there for the catalog. So you'll get to see a little bit more about how the quotes are, are incorporated and, and driving the argument. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I don't see any more on our chat. Um, beautiful catalog, by the way, beautifully written. And um, thanks to Deja for her yes, uh, laying you. it out and to Jude for printing it. Um, we really appreciate everything that's gone into this exhibition from the folks who participated um, and especially the staff for doing a beautiful job hanging the work in the image gallery, printed in the image gallery. Yeah, and I don't think there are any other questions. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye to Jessica and wish you the best in your uh, pursuit of your PhD. Uh, I'm sure you'll do fantastically well um, because you've done such a great job with this. And we look forward to your future adventures. Thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Yes, thank you. Be sure to check out the Brandywine Workshop and Archives um, website for more exciting news for the future and from the past. Uh, this program has been recorded, so in a little while it should be up on the uh, website if uh, you know someone who would like to see it and wasn't able to make it tonight. Thank you very much, everyone, and good night.